Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 16 of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam 4th Canto. And we're just beginning chapter 8 today. First of all, let us chant our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nir Vishesha Shunyavadi Pastya Chyade Shatarani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanicha Ananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivas Adi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakapa Trudibhyas Chakripa Sindhubhya Evacha Paridhanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namo Namaha Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Okay, so Bhakti Vai Bhava uh, Srimad Bhagavatam Kanto 4 and today we begin Chapter 8 Dhruva Maharaj Leaves Home for the Forest and this is a big chapter is 82 verses it may be the the biggest chapter we have done so far in the whole the whole bhakti vaibhava course it's really it's really big there are bigger actually as i recall anyway of course we'll see how it goes but let's have a look here and see what we're dealing with so, here yeah, 82 verses, we've broken it into eight sections. First section is verse 1 to verse 5, which we call various children of Lord Brahma. Second section, verse 6 to verse 13, Dhruva Maharaj insulted by his father and stepmother. Of course, we can just mention that up until now, up until the end of the seventh chapter, it was the story of Lord Shiva and Daksha and the cursing and the killing of Daksha and, oh Krishna, what a story, and the suicide of Sati. So, but now, chapter eight, here we are now, we're beginning the story of Dhruva Maharaj. So the second section then, verse 6 to verse 13, Dhruva Maharaj insulted by his father and stepmother. Third section, verse 14 to verse 23, Suniti, who's Dhruva's mother of course, Suniti advises Dhruva to take shelter of the Lord. Fourth section, verse 24 to verse 34, Narada Muni first instructs Dhruva. Fifth section, verse 35 to verse 38, Dhruva feels unable to accept Narada's first instructions. Section 6, verse 39 to verse 62, that's a big one. Verse 39 to verse 62, Narada instructs Dhruva further. So this is like the second, second round of instructions, you could say, of Narada to Dhruva. Then seventh section, verse 63 to verse 70, Narada advises King Uttanapad. <clears throat> King Uttanapad is the father of Dhruva and husband of Suniti. <clears throat> then eighth section, Verse 71 to verse 82, Dhruva practices extreme austerities. So, right, of course, first of all, we have to um, go through the first section and uh, verse 1 to verse 5, various children of Lord Brahma. Uh, so verse 1 to verse 5, First of all, we'll read the verses because even though they're verses which 
don't really have purports, is it? Not really. Well, yeah, there's at least one verse. There are two verses which don't have purports out of the five, but the other verses have fairly sub pretty substantial purports, actually. So let's just, to get a grip on the general story, what's going on, let's read the verses. It'll only take a couple of minutes. So verse 1, the great sage Maitreya said, the four great Kumar sages headed by Sanaka, as well as Narada, Ribu, Hangsa, Aruni and Yati, all sons of Brahma, did not live at home, but became Urdhvareta, or Naishtika Brahmacharis, unadulterated celibates. <clears throat> Basically like lifelong Brahmacharis. Verse 2. Another son of Lord Brahma was irreligion, whose wife's name was Falsity. From their combination were born two demons, named Dumba, or Bluffing, and Maya, or Cheating. These two demons were taken by a demon named Niriti, who had no children. Verse 3. Maitreya told Vidura, O great soul, from Dumba and Maya were born greed and nicrity or cunning. Cunning. From their combination came children named Krota, anger, and Himsa, envy. And from their combination were born Kali and his sister Durukti, harsh speech. For, O greatest of all good men, by the combination of Kali and harsh speech were born children named Mrityu, death, and Bhiti, fear. From the combination of Mrityu and Bhiti came children named Yatana, excessive pain, and Niraya, hell. And verse 5, my dear Vidura, I have summarily explained the causes of devastation. One who hears this description three times attains piety and washes the sinful contamination from his soul. Right, okay, so let's go through uh, in detail with the purports. <clears throat> Verse 1. The great sage Maitreya said, the four great Kumar sages headed by Sanaka, as well as Narada, Ribu, Hansa, Aruni, and Yati, all sons of Brahma, did not live at home, but became Urdhvareta, or Naishtika Brahmacharis, unadulterated celibates. So let's have a look at the purport here. So the first point Prabhupada makes is that the system of Brahmacharya, which of course we're all Familiar with in Prabhupada's ISKCON, um, it has been current, it's been in existence since the time of Brahma, since the beginning of the universe. So it's certainly not some sort of new invention at all. Uh, and basically the idea is that a section of the population of men would not marry. Their semen would lift to the brain instead of being just dispelled through sex life. So the semen would go up instead of down and out, would go up to the brain. So therefore they're called Urdva Retasa, those who lift up. And Prabhupada makes very interesting and very important point. I mean, I'm sure some of today's people who are just into well, illicit sex life as like their main focus in life. They would think that this is, you know, strange or something very unusual. Uh, being careful about one's semen. Anyway, Prabhupada says here semen is very important. Uh, and if it can go to the brain rather than just going out through sex life, 
then that semen can do wonderful things. The memory becomes better and life expectancy becomes greater. It helps yogis do austerities and, and be steady, fixed and focused. And like this, go to the spiritual world. And examples are the four Kumars and Narada Muni. Right, so now uh, the, the, the purport continues. There's a second paragraph. In it, there's, uh, well, Prabhupada refers to a significant phrase from the verse. It's from the, it's the third line of the verse, significant phrase, Naite Grihan Hyavasan. They didn't live at home. Naiti Grihan. They didn't live at home. Yeah, so Griha, Prabhupada explains, Griha means home. It also means wife. And in fact, you can take it that home means wife, not just a house. It doesn't just mean a room or a house. Home means a place where you live with, a, with your wife. Yes. So the fact that these personalities did not leave at home um, means they didn't accept a wife. So there was no question of their discharging semen. So the semen went up to the brain and sort of fertilized the brain and, and gave, strengthened the brain and the functionings of intelligence like that. So semen is meant to be discharged when you have a wife and there's the intention to beget children, of course. Otherwise, there's no injunction for discharging semen. Means there is no discharging of semen or there should not be. And these principles are followed from the beginning of creation. So anyway, this section, as we said, it's about other children of Brahma, the names, some of the names we read already in the verse. Um, so, but the thing is, so far in the Bhagavatam, we've been reading about descendants of Brahma from Manu's daughter, Prasuti, means Sati, and the story of Daksha's Yajna. So Maitreya is now going to explain about these other sons of Brahma. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Out of the many sons of Brahma, the Brahmachari sons headed by Sanaka and Narada did not marry at all. And therefore there's no question of narrating the history of their descendants. Because they had none. So now... Yes. So those were basically good sons, Naishtika Brahmacharis. But now, in verse 2, we're going from verse 2 for a few verses, we're going to hear about other sons of Lord Brahma who were not good sons. They were basically bad sons really. Um, at best, they, they caused tremendous destruction and chaos. And for that matter, they continue to. So another son, this is verse 2, another son of Brahma was irreligion, a dharma, whose wife's name was falsity. Sanskrit term is mrisha. From their combination were born two demons named Dumba or bluffing and Maya or cheating. These two demons were taken by, by a demon named Nariti who had no children. So in other words, Dumba and Maya, bluffing and cheating, their brother and sister. 
their brother and sister. But they married. They married. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada discusses all of this, that Adharma, irreligion, son of Brahma, married his sister, Mrisha, Mrisha, falsity. And this, Prabhupada says, this is the beginning of sex life between brother and sister. And this can only happen in human society where there is, when there is irreligion. And, and like a powerful presence of irreligion. So this means, of course, in the beginning of creation, Brahma not only created saintly sons like the Kumars or Narada Muni, but also demoniac offspring. Yes. So, and Narada, of course, in his previous life, he was very pious and had good association as the son of the maidservant. Then he was born as actually Narada Muni. And others were born according to their backgrounds and their capacities. So, Prabhupada explains that, uh, that the law of karma continues birth after birth. And when there's a new creation, the same karma, the same karma comes back with us. Yes, you can't can't escape your, your karma. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, they're born in different capacities according to karma. Even though their father is originally Brahma, who is the exalted qualitative incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So even though Brahma, he, he's the head of our Sampradaya, he's a really glorious person, great transcendental personality ultimately. But somehow or other, according to their karma, he gave birth to these demoniac children. Right, let's go on to verse 3. 3 and 4 have no purports, but we'll see it's the same idea of these people giving, these demoniac people giving birth to other demoniac people, boys and girls who then marry each other, brothers and sisters, and produce more children who are demons and who marry each other. Verse 3, Maitreya told Vidura, O great soul, from Dumba and Maya were born greed and nikriti, or cunning. From their combination, brother and sister, greed and cunning, from their combination came children named Krodha, anger, and Himsa, envy. So, yes, Anger and envy are the children, boy and girl, of greed and cunning. Then from the then they married, anger and envy married, brother and sister, and from their combination were born Kali and his sister Durukti, harsh speech. Okay, and verse four, so there's no purport there, now verse four. O greatest of all good men, by the combination of Kali and harsh speech, brother and sister, married, were born children named Mrityu, death, and Beatty, fear. From their combination, so death and fear, brother and sister, biological brother and sister, married. And then from their combination came uh, yatana, excessive pain, and niraya, hell. So in other words, this whole sequence, the whole sequence ends up in hell. Right. So, okay, so let's go on. The, uh, four doesn't have a purport. Let's go on to five, which does. My dear Vidura, I have summarily explained the causes of devastation. One who hears this description three times attains piety 
and washes the sinful contamination from his soul. So it just means, means read these couple, two or three, three verses. Yeah, three times and you'll become pious and free from sinful contamination. So creation, into the purport, creation takes place on the basis of goodness, whereas devastation takes place on the basis of irreligion. That's how it works. So here it's said, Prabhupada points out, here it's stated that the cause of devastation is adharma, irreligion. That's the cause of devastation. So the descendants of irreligion and falsity were bluffing and cheating. Then, so brother and sister, brother, uh, bluffing and cheating. Then their children were greed and cunning. So greed and cunning brother and sister, their children were anger and envy. And their brother and sister, their children, the children of anger and every envy, a quarrel and harsh speech. Uh, and then quarrel and harsh speech, brother and sister, their children are death and fear. And their brother and sister, death and fear. So their children are severe pain and hell. So these are all signs of devastation. So we should understand that where there's falsity, where there's bluffing, where there's cheating, where there's greed, cunning, anger, envy, quarreling, harsh speech, this means that this is extremely inauspicious. These are all signs of devastation. Yeah. In other words, it's, you know, it's not, they're, they're not c compatible with Krishna consciousness unless there's some very extreme and unusual circumstances. Otherwise, they're not compatible with Krishna consciousness. They, they will cause distraction if we try to include them in Krishna consciousness except for some extraordinary circumstances, yeah. So a pious person, Prabhupada says, will feel hatred for them if he hears about them. <laughs> That's amazing. Just hearing about them, a pious person will think, no, we don't like them, this is terrible. And if, if a pious person feels like that, Prabhupada says, this will, call, this will cause advancement in a life of piety. Right. And in this context, piety means cleansing of the heart. Becoming free from these things, becoming free from lust, anger, greed, etc. like that. Right. So Lord Chaitanya recommended we must cleanse the mirror of the mind. Then advancement on the path of liberation can begin. So we should learn to despise these causes of devastation, beginning with irreligion and cheating. Despise, if you understand despise, well, it just means like extremely intense hate. It's intense really intense. And Prabhupada says, then we will advance in a life of piety. And if we do, if we feel like that, if we do like that, then the possibility of attaining pure Krishna consciousness uh, will be easier and we won't be subject to repeated devastation. Prabhupada, Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the present life 
is repeated birth and death. But if we seek the path of liberation, we may be saved from repeated suffering. Okay, devotees, let's go on to the next section. Section two, Dhruva Maharaj, insulted by his father and stepmother. So it's from verse six to verse 13. And yeah, there are, we have to read the verses first to get an idea of what the flow of the story is. Verse 6, Maitreya continued, O best of the Kuru dynasty, I shall now describe before you the descendants of Swayambhuva Manu, who was born of a part of a plenary expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Verse 7, Swayambhuva Manu had two, two sons by his wife, Shatarupa, and the names of the sons were Uttanapad and Priyavrata, because both of them were descendants of a plenary expansion of Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They were very competent to rule the universe, to maintain and protect the citizens. Verse 8, King Uttanapad had two queens named Suniti and Suruchi. Suruchi was much more dear to the king. Suniti, who had a son named Druva, was not his favorite. That was verse 8, so verse 9. Once upon a time, King Uttanapad was patting the son of Suruchi, Uttama, placing him on his lap. Dhruva Maharaj, the little children, little children. Dhruva Maharaj was also trying to get on the king's lap, but the king did not very much welcome him. 10. While the child Dhruva Maharaj was trying to get on the lap of his father, Suruchi, his stepmother, became very envious of the child and with great pride, she began to speak so as to be heard by the king himself. Verse 11. King Suruchi told Dhruva Maharaj, My dear child, you do not deserve to sit on the throne or on the lap of the king. Surely you're also the son of the king, but because you did not take birth from my womb, you are not qualified to sit on, the fa on your father's lap. Okay, that's heavy, isn't it? Verse 11, so verse 12. My dear child, you are unaware that you were born not of my womb, but, a, but of another woman. Therefore, you should know that your attempt is doomed to failure. You are trying to fulfill a desire which is impossible to fulfill. Verse 13, if you at all desire to rise to the throne of the king, then you have to undergo severe austerities. First of all, you must satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan, and then, when you're favoured by him because of such worship, you shall have to take your next birth from my womb. Hare Krishna. <laughs> What? Isn't this just incredible? What an attitude. Pride. Arrogance. Okay. All right, so let's go back and go through the verses and purports. Uh, it's section two, Dhruva Maharaj insulted by his father and stepmother from verse six to verse 13. Verse 6, Maitreya continued, O best of the Kuru dynasty, I shall now describe before you the descendants of Swayambhuva Manu, who was born of a plenary portion 
of a plenary, sorry, who was born of a part of a plenary expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada makes the point that Brahma, of course, is a very powerful expansion of the Lord. He's a jiva, but he's especially empowered. So therefore, he's considered a plenary expansion of the Lord. And Prabhupada explains that sometimes there's no suitable jiva to become Brahma. So the Lord takes that, po that post. So therefore, Swayambhuva Manu was his son, Lord Brahma's son. Maitreya will now explain about the descendants of Swayambhuva Manu, all of whom are famous for piety. But before describing the pious descendants, Maitreya has talked of the impious ones. But that was those other verses. What was it? Two, three, and four. Yeah. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Purposely, therefore, he is next relating the history of the life of Dhruva Maharaj, the most pious king within this universe. Okay, verse 7. Swayambhuva Manu had two sons by his wife, Shatarupa, and the names of the sons were Uttanapad and Priyavrata. Uttanapad and Priyavrata, right? Yeah, Uttanapad is the father of Dhruva. Because both of them were descendants of the plenary expansion of Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they were very competent to rule the universe to maintain and protect the citizens. So there's a very short purport here, I'll just read it. It is said that these two kings, Uttanapad and Priyavrata, were specifically empowered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unlike the great Rishabha, who was the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. Not just empowered. So verse 8, King Uttanapad had two queens named Suniti and Suruchi. Suniti, of course, is the mother of Dhruva. Suruchi was much more dear to the king. Suniti, who had a son named Dhruva, was not his favourite. So the thing is, Maitreya wants to talk of the pious activities of the kings. Srimad Bhagavatam is what they call a Mahapurana. One of the great Puranas, actually, it's by far the greatest. And one of the characteristics of a Mahapurana, like, um, like Srimad Bhagavatam, is that uh, it, ha it has narrations about different important kings, generally who were devotees. Yeah. So anyway, Priyavrata was the first son of Swayambhuva Manu, Uttanapad was the second. But Maitreya immediately starts talking about Dhruva. Before he talks about Priyavrata or Uttanapad. Uh, he immediately talks of Dhruva, Prabhupada says, because Dhruva's activities are very attractive for devotees. So from his activities, Dhruva's activities, we can learn how to detach ourselves from material possessions and how to enhance our devotional service by severe austerities and penances. By hearing about Dhruva, we can enhance our faith in the Lord and contact the Lord. And thus, we can be elevated to the transcendental platform of devotional service. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the example of Dhruva Maharaja's austerities will immediately generate a feeling of devotional service 
in the hearts of the hearers. And I must say, it's, wow, the story of Druva, it is amazing. Verse 9, once upon a time, King Utanapad was patting the son of Suruchi, Utama, placing him on his lap. Dhruva Maharaj was also trying to get on the king's lap, but the king did not very much welcome him. So verse 10, while the child, Dhruva Maharaj, was trying to get on the lap of his father, Suruchi, his stepmother, became very envious of the child. And with great, tri great pride, she, she began to speak so, so as to be heard by the king himself. So nasty. Druva. Druva's five. It would be another thing if he's a young man, but he's five years old. Of course, he's not an ordinary child, but I think we can all understand that ordinary children aged five are very, very sensitive. They're really very sensitive and if you say something like this, like what she's saying, then, then a five-year-old child is going to really become disturbed and upset and, you know, it's just not nice. It's really insensitive and horrible. So, let's have a look at the purport here. Prabhupada says the king... Uttanapad, was equally affectionate to the two boys, actually. <coughs> but because of favoritism to the, sec to the wife, Suruchi, he couldn't welcome Druva on his lap because he knew she will object. So Suruchi understood this and proudly began to speak of the king's affection for her. And Prabhupada says, and look out ladies, fasten your seat belts. Prabhupada says, this is the nature of a woman. If she understands that the, her husband regards her as a favorite, she takes advantage. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, these symptoms are visible even in such an elevated society as the family of Swayambhuva Manu. Therefore, it's concluded that the feminine nature of woman is present everywhere. Verse 11. Queen Suruchi told Dhruva Maharaj, My dear child, you do not deserve to sit on the throne or on the lap of the king. Surely you're also the son of the king, but because you did not take your birth from my womb, you're not qualified to sit on your father's lap. So what pride! It's really arrogance. It's terrible. So Prabhupada explains that, that in her pride she told Dhruva that the qualification for sitting on the lap of the king is not just to be the son of the king, but rather you have to be born from her womb, otherwise you're not qualified. In other words, she, Suruchi, she is so qualified. So she is saying he's like an illegitimate son, an illegitimate son. Verse 12, my dear child, you're unaware that you were born not of my womb, but of another woman. Therefore, you should know that your attempt is doomed to, doomed to failure. You're trying to fulfill a desire which is impossible to fulfill. So Druva, he didn't know there was some distinction between his mother and this other, the second wife. 
he was naturally very affectionate towards his father. Yeah, so this is, this distinction is pointed out by Saruchi in her pride. So verse 13, if you at all desire to rise to the throne of the king, then you have to undergo severe austerities. First of all, you must satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan. And then when you're favoured by him because of such worship, you shall have to take your next birth from my womb. So Prabhupada gives very short purport, very to the point. Suruchi was so envious of Dhruva Maharaj that she indirectly asked him to change his body. According to her, first of all he had to die, then take his next birth in her womb, and only then would it be possible for Dhruva Maharaj to ascend the throne of his father. Incredible. I mean, you know, we just saw Daksha in the previous few chapters, enviousness, and what it did to him. So she, Suruchi, she's really bad. Really envious, kind of following in the footsteps of Daksha, you could say. So next section, three, verse 14 to verse 23. Suniti advises Druva, Suniti, <coughs> his actual mother, advises Druva to take shelter of the Lord. Yeah, okay, we're going to have to read through all these verses, of course, and then come back. Verse 14, the sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, as a snake, when struck by a stick, breathes very heavily. Dhruva Maharaj, having been struck by the strong words of his stepmother, began to breathe very heavily because of great anger. When he saw that his father was silent and did not protest, he immediately left the palace and went to his mother. Verse 15, when Dhruva Maharaj reached his mother, his lips were trembling in anger <clears throat> and he was crying very grievously. Queen Suniti immediately lift her son onto her lap while the palace residents who'd heard all the harsh words of Suruchi related everything in detail. Thus Suniti also became greatly aggrieved. Verse 16. This incident was unbearable to Suniti's patience. She began to burn as if in a forest fire. And in her grief, she became just like a burnt leaf <coughs> and so lamented. As she remembered the words of her co-wife, her bright, lotus-like face filled with tears. And thus she spoke. 17. She also was breathing very heavily and she did not know the factual remedy for the painful situation. Not finding any remedy, she said to her son, My dear son, don't wish for anything inauspicious for others. Wow, that's, that's good, isn't it? That's really good. Don't, <laughs> don't try to think about taking revenge. Anyone who inflicts pains upon others suffers himself from that pain. Suniti said, My dear boy, whatever's been spoken by Saruchi is so, because the king, your father, does not consider me his wife or even his maid servant. He feels ashamed to accept me. Therefore it's a fact that you have taken birth from the womb of an unfortunate woman. And by being fed from her breast, you have grown up. 
Verse 19. My dear boy, whatever's been spoken by Suruchi, your stepmother, <clears throat> although very harsh to hear, is factual. Therefore, if you desire at all to sit on the same throne as your stepbrother, Utama, then give up your envious attitude and immediately try to execute the instructions of your stepmother. Without further delay, you must engage yourself in worshipping the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Verse 20, Sunita continued, The Supreme Personality of Godhead is so great that simply by worshipping his lotus feet, your great-grandfather, Lord Brahma, acquired the necessary qualifications to create this universe. Although he's unborn and is the chief of all living creatures, he's situated in that exalted post because of the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whom even great yogis worship by controlling the mind and regulating the life air, prana. Verse 21, <clears throat> Suniti informed her son, your grandfather, Swayambhuva Manu, executed great sacrifices with distribution of charity, and thereby, with unflinching faith and devotion, he worshipped and satisfied the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By acting in that way, he achieved the greatest success in material happiness, and afterwards achieved liberation, which is impossible to obtain by worshipping the demigods. 22. My dear boy, you should also take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who's very kind to his devotees. Persons seeking liberation from the cycle of birth and death always take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service. Becoming purified by executing your allotted occupation. Just situate the Supreme Personality of Godhead in your heart. And without deviating for a moment, engage always in his service. 23. <clears throat> My dear Druva, as far as I'm concerned, I do not find anyone who can mitigate your distress but the Supreme Personality of Godhead whose eyes are like lotus petals. Many demigods, such as Lord Brahma, seek the pleasure of the goddess of fortune. But the goddess of fortune herself, with a lotus flower in her hand, is always ready to render service to the Supreme Lord. Right, so let's go through with the purports. And we'll see how far we get. I don't expect well anyway let's just say we'll see how far we get so <clears throat> it's section three suniti advises druva <clears throat> to take shelter of the lord from verse 14 to verse 23 verse 14 the sage maitreya continued my dear vidura as a snake when struck by a stick breathes very heavily Dhruva Maharaj, having been struck by the strong words of his stepmother, began to breathe, breathe very heavily because of great anger. When he saw that his father was silent and did not protest, he immediately left the palace and went to his mother. So there's no purport here. We go on to verse 15. When Dhruva Maharaj reached his mother, his lips were tre trembling in anger, and he was crying very grievously. Queen Suniti immediately lifted her son onto her lap, while the palace re residents, who had heard all the harsh words of Suruchi, related everything in detail. Thus Suniti also became greatly aggrieved. 16. So there's no purport to 15 either. Uh, now we go on to verse 16. 
This incident was unbearable to Suniti's patience. She began to burn as if in a forest fire, and in her grief she became just like a burnt leaf and so lamented. As she remembered the words of her co-wife, her bright, lotus-like face filled with tears, and thus she spoke. So there's very short purport here. I'll just read the purport. When a man is aggrieved, I mean, Prabhupada means a person. When a man is aggrieved, he feels exactly like a burnt leaf in a forest fire. Sunidhi's position was like that. <clears throat> Although her face was as beautiful as a lotus flower, it dried up because of that burning fire caused by the harsh words of her co-wife. Right, so on we go to verse 17. She, was, she also was breathing very heavily and did not know the factual remedy for the painful situation. Not finding any re remedy, she said to her son, My dear son, don't wish for anything inauspicious for others. Anyone who inflicts pains upon others suffers himself from that pain. I mean, that is excellent advice, isn't it? That is just really, I mean, that's just very important advice for all of us. Because it happens, maybe to everyone, maybe not everyone, but it happens to a lot of people, that they get mistreated by someone, even by someone who they, did, they really didn't expect to, to mistreat them. But that person mistreats them. And the mind, oh, the mind can then <laughs> do all sorts of things. How to get revenge like that. But she's saying, no, don't wish for anything inauspicious for others. Anyone who inflicts pains upon, upon others suffers himself from that pain. So, verse, so there's no purport here. Verse 18, which also has no purport. My dear boy, whatever's been spoken by Suruchi is so, because the king, your father, does not consider me his wife or even his maidservant. He feels ashamed to accept me. Therefore, it's a fact that, that you have taken birth from the womb of an unfortunate woman. And by being fed from her breast, you've grown up. So again, I said no purport, but we go on to 19, which has a, a purport. My dear boy, whatever has been spoken by Suruchi, your stepmother, although very harsh to hear, is factual. Therefore, if you desire at all to sit on the same throne as your stepbrother Uttama, then give up your envious attitude. She can see he's got an envious attitude. He's, he's really disturbed like that in that sort of way. So give up your envious attitude and immediately try to execute the instructions of your stepmother. Without further delay, you must engage yourself in worshipping the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Right, so there's a short purport here. Prabhupada says that these harsh, harsh words of Suruchi were true. Because unless you're favoured by the Lord, Supreme Personality of Godhead, you can't achieve success in life. Man proposes, God disposes. Yeah. We desire and the Lord decides whether he's going to fulfill our desire or not. And sometimes he does not. So she agreed that Dhruva should worship the Lord. 
Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, indirectly the words of Su Suruchi were a benediction for Dhruva Maharaj, for because of the influence of his stepmother's words, he became a great devotee. Indeed. So let's have a look here. Okay, verse 20, let's read verse 20. Suniti continued, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is so great that simply by worshipping his lotus feet, your great-grandfather Lord Brahma acquired the necessary qualifications to create this universe. Although he's unborn and is the chief of all living creatures, he, now she's talking about Brahma, although he's unborn Brahma, and as the chief of all living creatures, he's situated in that exalted post because of the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whom even great yogis worship by controlling the mind and regulating the life ear, prana. So again, there's very short purport. The Lord is so great that Dhruva's great-grandfather, Brahma, Dhruva's father, Dhruva's grandfather is uh, Swayambhuva Manu. And Swayambhuva Manu's son is Uttanapad, and Uttanapad's son is Dhruva. And Swayambhuva Manu's father is Lord Brahma. So he's Dhruva's, Brahma's, Dhruva's great, great grandfather. So, um, Brahma did penance and austerity and thereby got the position of creator of the universe by the Lord's mercy. So to be successful, one not only has to do penance and austerity, but one also has to depend on the mercy of the Lord. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, this indication had been given to Dhruva Maharaj by his stepmother and was now confirmed by his own mother, Suniti. Okay, so we'll carry on. Tomorrow will be day 17 and we'll continue on from verse 21. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.